Welcome to the Deep Dive. Today we're exploring uh, something I think a lot of us can relate to, these kind of subtle false fixes we lean on. You know, the things that can, maybe without us realizing, lead to what our sources are calling an addictive lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So our mission today is to dig into some really surprising insights about these habits and uh, introduce you to a pretty new solution based on some hot new science. Okay, let's set the scene a bit. You know those nights, things get tough, and suddenly you're on the couch, maybe it's late, and well, hello, Ben and Jerry's. I mean, seriously, who decided a pint has four servings? When you've had a rotten day or you're deep in a law and order marathon, let's be honest, that's one serving. It feels good in the moment, right? A quick escape. But you know, it's not just the ice cream. Our sources talk about a whole range of these things, that glass of wine you really need after work, or just like staring endlessly at screens, working crazy hours, maybe 5 a.m. to midnight, grabbing whatever food is easiest, not sleeping enough. Exactly. And what's really key here, I think, is that these things do give you a short-term fix. They feel like they're helping. They act like these, well, addictive-like ways to cope. They might fill a void for a minute, you know, comfort, escape, whatever it is. But the problem is they tend to boomerang right back, often leaving you feeling kind of worse in the long run. Yeah, that boomerang effect is rough. So for this deep dive, we're going on a bit of a journey. We're calling it mind, mouth, and muscle. Mm. We'll get into the science behind what's actually happening when we fall into these patterns. And we'll start with the mind because, well, that's where it all begins, doesn't it? Yeah. Right. So the mind. Our sources kick things off here looking at some uh, pretty interesting science about how our brains work, how they respond. And they even touch on some observed tendencies, you know, between men and women. Yeah. And connecting that to the bigger picture, the sources mm -hmm. talk about how maybe in certain situations men might show brain activity that's more let's say, localized, task-focused, kind mm -hmm. of on or off. Mm -hmm. Whereas women sometimes show uh, more connections between the brain hemispheres, more interhemispheric chatter, maybe. Now, this isn't about saying one is simple and one's complicated. Not at all. It's just different ways of processing things. And you can see how this might play out in how we handle stress or even how we spend our resources. Like some research points to men maybe spending more on, say, entertainment hobbies, while women often lean towards caregiving roles, sometimes, you know, maybe even too much for their own good. It's just useful context as we look at how our brains react to these false fixes we're talking about. Hmm. And speaking of looking at brains, PT scans come up. Our sources say these are just extraordinary tools we can actually like peer inside. And in a healthy brain scan, you see this bright, mm -hmm. like red orange glow. In the reward center. That's the dopamine doing its thing. Yeah. You know, that pleasure neurotransmitter connected with receptors. That's how it's supposed to work. But here's the kicker. The sources show that everything abuse, and let's be clear, that's not just drugs or alcohol. It can be food, behaviors, anything compulsive. It causes actual damage right there in the reward center. So this isn't just, oh, I feel bad. Your brain is literally changing. These habits can make your dopamine receptors less sensitive which means you need more and more of that thing just to feel, well, maybe okay. The high gets less and less. Take food addiction. It's absolutely real. And it's driven by what they call hyperpalatables, foods that are just loaded with sugar, fat, salt, engineered, really. They hit those reward centers so hard they kind of bypass your natural I'm full signals. It makes them incredibly hard to resist. But, and this is crucial, the good news is this damage. It's absolutely reversible. We can see the damage on scans, but we can also see the potential for healing. Okay, so everything abuse is damaging. What about sugar? Just mm -hmm. plain old sugar. I mean, it's everywhere. Our sources drop a bombshell here. They asked, did you know sugar is actually more addictive than cocaine? That sounds yeah. wild. It does sound wild, but it comes from some really hot science. There was this fascinating study with rats and Oreos. So the researchers, they gave the rats morphine, then cocaine, and then they offered them an Oreo cookie. And they were measuring specific gene changes, right, to see if the Oreo triggered a similar response or maybe even worse than the drugs. And the result was pretty shocking. It was the same and sometimes even worse. The rats, they literally, they bagged the morphine, bagged the cocaine, and went straight for the Oreo filling. They were like ripping the cookie apart to get to the middle, which I don't know about you, but that sounds familiar. Yeah, a little too familiar maybe. It's just a powerful example of how these seemingly innocent things can hijack our brand's reward system. Wow. Okay, so that's the reward center. But there's another really important part of the brain involved here, right? Mm -hmm. The prefrontal cortex, yeah. kind of right behind your forehead. The uh, the smarty pants part is what yeah. yes, Zorz calls it, where the executive function hangs out. It does all the, you know, organizing, planning, staying focused, being mindful, reining in those impulses and patience, yeah. irritability, yeah. all that grown-up stuff. Exactly. And here's the problem. 
when you're stuck in that cycle, that addictive like lifestyle, relying on those daily false fixes, that crucial part of your brain, it gets hammered. It really does. It gets impaired. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, it's incredibly hard to do all those things you just listed. Your ability to think clearly, make good decisions, control impulses, it's just compromised. End of story, really. And what else hammers that prefrontal cortex? <laughs> Stress, right? I love that observation. Stressed, spilled backwards, is desserts. There's definitely something to that. Stress really does impair it, and so does not getting enough sleep. Oh, definitely. People sometimes brag, oh, I only need four hours of sleep. But the science is clear. That lack of real rest, it messes with your hormones. Your growth hormone production goes down. Stress hormones like cortisol go up. And that combo often leads to more visceral fat, that dangerous deep belly fat. And that, in turn, is strongly linked to a higher risk of chronic diseases, morbidity, mortality. I mean, these are serious consequences. We really need to pay attention. Okay, so... We really dug into the mind, the brain's reward center, the prefrontal cortex, mm -hmm. how these false fixes mess with things upstairs. But like you said, it's not just in our heads. These habits show up in our bodies too. So let's shift gears. Let's talk mouth and muscle. How does this all play out physically? Like, have you heard of sitting disease? Mm -hmm. That term itself is kind of alarming. It is alarming and it's real. The Mayo Clinic and lots of other research are very clear about this. Sitting for long periods dramatically increases your risk for things like heart disease and metabolically. Yeah. Your body just kind of slows down. It gets much worse at handling blood sugar, managing energy. It's like metabolic glacierization almost. It's really, really detrimental. Seriously, if you're sitting right now, stand up. Just for a second. Okay. Right standing. Feel that. Just that simple act starts to change things. It impacts your gene expression, believe it or not, in a good way. It literally helps save your life. Wow. Okay. Staying standing then. Mm -hmm. Now let's look even deeper inside. Our sources show a CCAT scan image. And you see this, uh, this white area inside the belly. That's internal belly fat, visceral fat. Mm -hmm. And the sources are saying this isn't just passive stuff. It's active. It pumps out inflammatory things. Mm -hmm. And they draw a direct line. These false fixes, this addictive lifestyle leads right to this accumulation. It, it shows up right there inside you. Yeah, that's an excessive amount of visceral fat you see there. It's a huge red flag for metabolic problems. But, and this is the hopeful part we keep coming back to, is absolutely reversible. Yeah. It's serious, yes. But it doesn't have to be permanent. You can change that picture. Okay, which leads us perfectly into the solution. This is where it gets really exciting. Our sources call it the hottest new science. Something maybe a lot of you haven't heard much about yet. Epigenetics. Yes. And it sounds fancy, maybe, but the core idea is actually pretty straightforward and revolutionary. See, for ages, we kind of thought our DNA was our destiny, right? You get double genetic hand, and that's that. You're stuck with it. But epigenetics turns that idea on its head. It shows us that, basically. Every single thought you have, every bite of food you eat, every step you take, these things actually change how your genes work, how they're expressed. It's like dimmer switches on your genes. You can turn some up, some down. It changes how your whole body communicates with itself. And the bottom line, it changes your destiny. You get to write your own life script. It's incredibly empowering. That does sound empowering. Almost. <laughs> Too good to be true. But you're saying the science is solid. Like that agouti mouse experiment? Yeah. That sounds like where it all started. Exactly. That was kind of the birth of epigenetics. Yeah. It was remarkable. They had these mice, the agouti mice, that were genetically doomed, basically. Mm. Destined to be fat, yellow, sick, and die early because of this specific gene. So what did the researchers do? Something surprisingly simple. They fed the mother mice greens. Now, why greens? Well, it turns out greens are packed with these things called methyl donors. Mm. Think of them like little sticky notes or chemical tags. They attach to the DNA. And these tags tell the genes whether to be active or inactive. They send new instructions. And it's not just greens. Physical activity does it. Meditation does it. They all change gene expression. So the result with the mice, the babies, they weren't fat, yellow, and sick. They were born lean healthy, vibrant, totally different outcome. Yeah. yeah. Breakthrough stuff. Back in 2007. So now when you're thinking about food, it's not just eat your greens. It's I'm going to score some methyl donors. I'm going to methylate my genes, change their expression. It gives you a whole new motivation rate. You're right. optimizing your genetic potential. That's incredible. Yeah. And it's not just mice, right? You mentioned epiphany stories, real people doing this. Oh, absolutely. Betty Lou Sweeney. What a story. She started out. Picture this. 250 pounds, 68 years old, taking 26 different medications. She said she felt half dead. And she had her wake-up call, her epiphany, literally in the ICU. 
And she just decided that's it. She fought her food addiction, changed her habits completely. It wasn't easy. She slugged it out, you know, took her maybe two, three years, a real battle. But guess what? She ended up in the Guinness Book of World Records. No way. For what? For holding the longest plank. 36 minutes. Can you imagine? 36 minutes. That's insane. Insane. Just an amazing testament to what's possible with this epigenetic transformation. And another quick one, totally different vibe, but just as inspiring. I met this guy at the Senior Olympics, 93 years old, 93, on the track and field team. And he was just so full of life. He didn't seem 93 at all. He carried himself like he was, I don't know, for 23. We ended up chatting for like three hours. He just radiated health. It just shows when you swap those false fixes for healthy choices, when you embrace these epigenetic ideas, everything starts looking up. Your potential for just feeling good is amazing. So, wow, mind, mouth, muscle. We've covered a lot of ground. But it seems like when you put it all together, when you make these changes rooted in epigenetics, the science is saying you're not just changing your future health risks you're actually going to feel really, really good, like right now. That's exactly <laughs> it. And maybe that brings us to the final thought here, the big takeaway, the real wealth. Mm -hmm. It truly really is health. And now, knowing this about epigenetics, knowing you have this power to influence your own genes, your own health destiny, think about how that knowledge can ripple outwards, how you can share it, pass it on. It could affect not just your life, but maybe generation after generation to come. Pretty profound stuff to think about.